Um, here we are on uh, November 15th. This is our third Friday monthly one pair states call. Um, our topic for the day is uh, outreach and uh, into the diverse uh, a black community uh, across the country, uh, urban, suburban, rural, um, and so honored to have uh, our, our wonderful guest today, uh, Andrew Miller, uh, who uh, I work with over at Center for Common Ground, a Black-led organization uh, working on voting rights, civil rights, and and really bread and butter issues, uh, the, the, the democracy um, centers that uh, Andrew has launched and is actually working on with my housemate here, Steve Schaff, uh, is a way to keep the work going forward. Um, and uh, between elections and really working on identifying, as Andrea calls it, pain points and getting people to mobilize and work uh, year round uh, on issues that keep us together. Um, and, and she'll go deeper into that. Lode Coleman is a, uh, is a, is a, a midwife by day, a political activist by night, uh, was uh, started to run a, a congressional for a congressional seat earlier this year. Um, and maybe she can answer the question of why, why she was doing that. And and uh, and then um, and and Lo Dave Coleman is on our board. Andrea is a senior advisor. Michelle Hamilton is also with us. Is on our board at One Pair of States. Uh, Michelle is in uh, uh, State College, Center County area of Pennsylvania, and she brings some uh, immigrant perspective here too. Uh, her her she descends or uh, uh, has roots in Jamaica. Uh, originally was uh, raised in New York and now moved over to Pennsylvania, working on uh, issues of, of uh, domestic violence, support for uh, primarily women who are abused, and we'll happy to hear what Michelle has to offer as well. So with that said, um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we look forward to the presentations, about five, seven minutes each. We'll open it up for Q and A. So we're going to have all three presenters go through, and then on the uh, and then so hold your questions or drop them in the chat. You can use the chat. Just click the little button at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's a should be a chat button bubble on the bottom. Um, so feel free to drop your questions into the chat as they occur to you, and then we'll make a run through those in the second twenty minute segment of the presentation today, and then on the last twenty minutes. Uh, we want to do some announcements and uh, encourage folks to attend our next in, uh, it, intergenerational summit on November 23rd from 12 to 2 Eastern time. A great opportunity to discuss how diverse communities, especially more vulnerable communities, are dealing with uh, the, the current situation, what I'm calling the coming storm. Uh, and so this is this is a really important conversation. So that's a week from tomorrow, and that'll be online as well. Mike is sending around announcements. Mike, did I miss anything? No, uh, good job. Thanks. Um, okay, you bet. So why don't we uh, open up here with uh, uh, Andrea, followed by Lode, followed by Michelle. And thank you again, everyone, for being here. Uh, Andrea. Uh, well, hey, Chuck, thank you and Mike and everybody for inviting me. Um, I have been involved with Medicare for all since probably 2007. And it was definitely part of my platform when I ran for office in 2008. So one of the things that I've learned through a lot of the groups where I have been very, very involved with them is if you wish to recruit a diverse community, then your website, which is basically what everybody sees as they go to see who you are. If people don't see themselves, they're not going to stay. And I took a look at your website and on the event, I saw a group photo that had one black person. You're gonna have to go, somebody somewhere has got to know at least two, maybe three black people and get them to be in a picture with you. It When, when I look at your website, it is not at all inviting. Um, I am the 1% 
in that I am super educated on policy. I'm super educated on politics. And that is not your normal busy person. Now, a lot of the folks that work with me um, who are in low-income communities, because that's where my democracy centers are, they are in low-income communities, and many of them are run by low-income people. The first thing I would hear if I sent them to your website is, they aren't interested in having us join. We can just tell from looking at the website. So I suggest that you work very hard on getting that fixed. That's a few photographs. It should take you maybe two hours to do that. Um, language. We had a very lovely lady here who's had, I don't know what OPS is. Um, if people don't know what your acronyms mean, that is also a problem. Everybody knows that uh, what the NAACP is, even though they may not realize what the actually stands for, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they've been around it enough, they know it. You've got something new that people don't know. And if they don't know, they're not going to learn anything by being confronted with a series of initials all over the place. Spell it out, take more space. You aren't paying by the letter on your website or on the materials that you put out. Everything that we do in my world, we spell it out because we are teaching people about who we are. We very gently work on teaching people about policy. Uh, back in the day when I was lobbying on the Equal Rights Amendment, we used to say ERA. Now, ERA, it's never called that. It is only referred to as the Equal Rights Amendment. It is time, drop all those initials and say what you mean. So that when people say, oh, and gee, one pair states, what is that? You're educating them on one thing, not two. You're not trying to teach acronyms. Acronyms aren't important. The topic, of what you have is very, very important. And so many people, if they were invited in and understood what you were talking about, would really like it. Lode Coleman, because she is a midwife, because she is in the medical field, because she sees the lack of healthcare in the black community, she also is in that 1% on health care policy. So I would be very, very happy to work on bringing this into our democracy centers as one of their issues because most of our democracy centers, when we put together and why are you voting in this election? Affordable health care in virtually every democracy center, regardless of the state, made the list. So let's make it accessible to people who are not in the club. Let's open up the club and welcome everybody in. Thank you so, so much, Andrea. Really, really on point, uh, concise, beautiful. Thank you so much. And we will absolutely uh, work on those 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 points. Um, let's bring up at this point, Michelle. I don't see Lode in the room uh, at this point. Does anybody? Mike? I don't uh, see her yet. 
do you have, I'll step away and call her just to make sure. So forgive me for just stepping back. I'm going to, I'm going to ring her up. Um, but in the meantime, Michelle Hamilton, our wonderful uh, organizer and activist and uh, uh, board member is uh, going to be joining us right now. Michelle, do you want to okay. come up? Yeah, sure. Yes. Thank you okay. so much, Michelle, for being with us. Hi. So uh, my name is Michelle Hamilton. I live in Center County, PA. Um, I'm one of the several people who need to wear a bag over our head because we went for Trump. <laughs> but but I'm taking the bag off my head for now. Um, unlike Andrea, I'm the exact opposite. I'm a very regular person who has a very regular job that is not policy. Um, and I belong to like every progressive group, probably too many. Um, and basically, I guess what I would want to talk about is less direct things and more mind frame, because it's been my experience since I'm I live in the center of the state. I'm one of the few black people in any progressive space. <laughs> um, so that a lot of times the problems we have is a problem of mindset. And if your mindset is right, you can attract people of color and you can attract younger people and you can attract working class people, but they're just gonna walk right out if the mindset's not right. So um, I think I would start with sort of definitely never saying, well, how come this particular group of people never joins us? I think within progressive spaces, not even particularly one payer states, but I'll pick another group now that I'm in, National Organization for Women. Sometimes people get around and be like, well, how come we don't have as many people of color? Or how come we don't have as many working class women? Or how come we don't have as many young people? Just by saying that, the words that we say affect how we think. And just by putting that out there, you're sort of putting it on those other groups and stuff. And you're also sort of making a they, them dynamic. There are definitely people of color and definitely black people who will join one pair of states and any other progressive group you're in. I can tell you, especially in places where there is much less diversity, the black people are on every single thing. Like every black person I'm on that is able to be politically and socially active is in four or five different things, plus holding down jobs, plus raising families. So there are people out there and stuff if you're sort of willing to do the things you need to do to get them. But part of it is starting mentally with, with how you're framing your argument or your discussion. So I think we really need to look at internally issues within the organization. And when I say within the organization, I mean the single payer movement in general, not particularly one payer states. You know, um, sometimes when I do trainings on domestic violence, where they're talking about diversity and outreach to people of color for board memberships and things. I'm like, look at where your organization physically is housed. What part of the county is it in? Is it even accessible? You know, how are you, what is the media that you're putting out and stuff? You know, how are you framing the issue? So take me off screen. Right. Thank you. Thanks. 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 So, I think we also need to look at the fact that we still and stuff have an incredibly segregated society and more effort needs to be put in and stuff to like outreach and stuff. It's not simply putting out one thing and then assuming that people are going to come to your thing. Um, so I also want to sort of say that there's definite, even when you've attracted people, there's certain things that can de-attract them. So I don't know what other people are going to say, but I never respond very well to a pitch that is just a diversity pitch where, oh, we need you on our board or we need you to do our thing because we need more people of color or we need more working class people. That is not a pitch to me. That is, I want a direct pitch to me as to what talents you see me having that can actually help your organization and how me being in your organization can help me on other issues that I'm working on because I'm gonna be more educated on single payer or climate or whatever the thing is. So you definitely wanna make it a pitch to the person and to their talents or their reputation in the community and stuff. And just also 
sometimes just catching people at the right time and giving them opportunities to do more things. Like don't put someone in and then they're only doing this or only doing the diversity piece, but the part that is more about finances, for example, that's something you don't really consider them for because that person may want to do finances or at least learn about finances. Just because we're people of color or younger or whatever, it doesn't mean we just want to do outreach or just want to do certain things. Um, I also think we need to sort of be aware of being ready for once people of color come into your space. So within the domestic violence movement, when we first started having shelters, the shelters were very segregated. And one could make an argument that in some places they might still be. But I'm talking particularly about Pennsylvania, because that's what I know. And um, there was a push by the women of color that worked in the DV centers to be in the community, to talk to survivors of color about how shelter could be an option. And they actually created this very holistic way of doing it, which I don't have the time to get into now, but is really great and um, emphasizes healthy relationships. Um, and so then women of color, particularly Black women, did end up using the shelter system more. But what happened is the shelters were not really ready for them. They said they were ready for them, but in their heart, they weren't ready for them. And there were prejudices that definitely came out. There were issues of not really having a plan for how to get people to where they needed to go. Um, and just understanding the support systems that people needed to have in place. And so it was a very rocky time. And so I guess what I'm saying is, if this is a goal of yours to increase the overall diversity of the organizations you're in, you want to like be able to know that you're really ready for that, that there is actually going to be change. And that might mean changing when you have your meeting times. Because for me right now, I am literally taking time off my job. So this is an hour that I cannot use later on if I need to do something else to be on this meeting, which is fine. But if all the meetings are at this time, then like I could go to one out of four. I can't go to every single meeting that's at this time. You know what I'm trying to say? So just be aware of those things. And I guess on a positive note, because um, I'm in this group that is a reproductive justice group that also is for progressive faiths and stuff. Um, and the president of that group, which now I'm the co-president, like the way he's a white man and he attracted me, we met at um, progressive summits. If there are progressive summits in your towns, please go to them. They're a great way to actually meet with different groups of people. Um, and like every year I would be at the summit with another group and he would be there with his religious coalition, but he would always, we always would engage in a conversation. And, you know, he always would be like, anytime that you want to be on the board or learn more about the board or whatever, he'd always have something to sign. But it was like a personal pitch to me based on my interests. And it was obviously effective. And then once I joined, it was like, well, would you like to do this? Would you like to learn more about this? Understanding that sometimes I couldn't be on every single meeting of things and stuff, but also respecting that I was bringing in multiple talents, but also wanted to learn about other things. So like I said, I don't know what other people are gonna talk about, but for me, it's all about the mindset. And if you have the proper mindset, then you can work on the rest of the stuff and fix the rest of the stuff. But if the thinking is not correct, then everything else is going to not be correct. And as Black people, we're going to feel it. We're going to sense it. We're going to feel it. So that's what I got. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks so, so much, Michelle. Yeah, our, our minds and hearts and brains need to all be locked in here into this effort, um, welcoming all communities, but the Black community in particular, where our focus for today. Thank you so, so much. Um, Lode did join us uh, just a couple minutes ago. 
Um, and then we look forward to uh, Lode's uh, comments. And then we'll open it up for Q and A, and then we'll work our way through the chat. Uh, Mike, you're, you're, you you're you want to monitor the chat? Can you work the chat for us, or is that good? Right, we can work it together. Lode, awesome. Thank you so much, Lode. Give no. You the, thank you, Chuck. <laughs> thank you, you're Chuck, Mike, Andrea, everyone here, Michelle, everyone here. Thank you for this opportunity and holding space uh, to have this discussion. So I'm going to come from a perspective, a uh, reproductive justice, environmental justice perspective, as far as what I have experienced and what the community um, has expressed through my working in helping to push legislation, if, if, if you will. And I've narrowed this experience down to three things, respect, hold space, and include. OK, so in many of the organizations that I've come across, we'll listen to the concerns, we'll listen to the experience of that Black people, African-American people, fundamentally Black Americans, what, however we're going to slice this pie, right? We'll listen to the experience, but then it'll be, well, there's nothing that we can do or one thing that we get a lot in Georgia, welcome to the South, this is the South, I don't know what you were expecting. And with that type of attitude, we cannot have any progression because you have to respect the experience. If I, if, if I am telling you that when I cross the street, I get run over every time, right? Every time I cross this street, I get run over. So I don't want to cross the, at this intersection. I want to cross at the next interse intersection, right? We have to re respect that experience. There's a reason why I don't want to cross right here. I want to cross at the next one. And when I cross at that next intersection, I don't get run over, right? So respect that experience. You may not experience it yourself. You may not even see it. You may not even know anyone that has seen that experience but you have to respect the experience that fundamentally Black Americans are expressing. And that's something that we see time and time again uh, in our political cycles. We're telling you, we're signaling like, hey, this might not be the best candidate or this might not be the best move or this candidate needs to say something to address X, Y, Z, and it doesn't happen. And then it flops. And then it's like, well, Black women did tell you, right? Or the Black community did tell you. So again, respect the experience of the Black, fundamentally Black Americans, descendants of American slavery. Respect that experience, right? Then hold space. Holding space, I uh, believe Michelle uh, touched on this. Holding space is pretty much what we're doing today, right? We're having the discussion. We are making room for the new. We're making room for the advancement, for the progression, for the consideration even. Um, so hold space for the needs specifically. So if we're talking about one payer states, we're talking about state-based universal health care, hold space for what Black people are saying they need universal health care to do for them specifically. I know in the past I have brought up concerns why I was seeing, you know, pushback with Black people getting on board with state-based universal health care. And one of those issues is, hey, if we know the history of this country, we know what happened to fundamentally Black Americans or American descendants of slavery, they should be a protected group within this piece of legislation as well. So right where we see Alaska Native, right where we see American Indian, there should be Black American or descendants of American slavery or um, FBA, whatever that's legislatively correct, right? That's not a word, but whatever would be appropriate to put, whatever title, whatever identifier that would be appropriate to put in the legislation, it should be there. Because again, if we keep saying, we hear your concerns, we know what you've been through, we respect what you've been through, we respect that this is your experience, then there has to be some addressing, right? Otherwise, we're just doing more of the same. There's no progression. We're just saying, we hear you, but yeah, you're just gonna have to sit. You, you still gotta sit in the back of the bus. Like, we'll take your vote. We'll take your emotional intelligence. We'll take your 
uh, willfulness and your resiliency to continue to fight. We'll take all of that, but we're not going to provide anything tangible. That's what that's saying. So again, hold space and then finally include. And that inclusion would be if we're saying we want to meet the needs, if we're saying we want to get uh, the Black community involved, include Black issues in your movement. What we find time and time again is that we have intersectionality. That's a thing, right? Many of us say, I'm at the intersection of the Black American experience and LGBTQ, right? Or you name it, because there are hundreds, thousands of intersections. I personally don't believe in intersectionality because in fundamentally Black, Black American, American descendants of slavery, whatever movement we have going on, we include whomever else is victimized under that theme, right? But we that is not reciprocated. We don't see that. And I can't say all because I have not read or seen all. But in many, the vast majority of movements, legislation, Black issues are not included. However, the Black tear, the Black uh, emotions, again, the Black boots to the ground will be used to push the agenda. But there's no inclusion. So... To sum it up, that, that's what would be my concern or, or that would be my input just based off of what I've seen uh, working to get uh, midwifery accepted by insurance, by Medicaid, from working with uh, uh, for, for Black maternal wellness, environmental justice, climate change issues. These are the things that we've run into when we are partnering or building coalition. And it puts organizers like myself in a very tender space because again, if I'm if I'm being authentic and true to what it is that I am doing, I have to acknowledge when we're not being respected or we're not the space isn't being held. It's not authentic. It's just we did it to say we did it, right? We threw you a bone. We are holding space and allowing you to speak at this meeting, but we we have no plans of working with you. We have no plans of actually including your concerns and what we have going on. So again, respect, hold space, and include. Those are the top three things that I've seen that will get uh, Black supporters, the Black uh, demographic on board. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Lede. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I just running through my head, hearing Andrea, hearing Michelle, hearing Lede, it's this has got to be intentional. We've got to be purposeful. And it's also needs to be right woven into our strategic planning vision. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be, as you say, inclusive, uh, respectful, and 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 uh, making sure that that space is is uh, uh, is is preserved is welcoming. Um, so the the other one of the other terms that we've come to use here, but we need to practice it. You know, radical hospitality, right? Is that is that 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 intentional welcoming? Um, and so thank you so much, Lode and Michelle and Andrew. Let's uh, open it up for questions now. Um, but. Uh, if, so people, if you want to just raise your hands, Mike, you can just uh, take me off screen if you want. I'm, I'm okay being off screen, just having the, the whole group together. Um, I don't want the spotlight on me right now. Um, but the um, the one, a couple of questions really that are more pointed toward Andrea. Um, I think the democracy centers, I think people want to learn just a little bit more about the democracy centers. Where can we send people for that? to learn more and people are wondering where are they located um and yeah so if you want to start with that and then we'll bounce around and uh take questions from the from the from the floor thanks andrea oh oh thanks chuck i am dropping a link in the chat that Perfect. will tell you where some of them are there are seven in virginia uh, we will be starting one up in Charlotte, North Carolina. There is one in Florence, South Carolina. Um, we have three in Alabama. So in 
Huntsville, Mobile, and Elma, which interestingly enough is where we just won an election. As I said, nobody cares about Virginia. Nobody cares about Alabama either. So we have really built up the democracy centers so that local people in local communities, in many instances, these are low income communities, we can work on handling some of the most basic needs. In um, most of our democracy centers in Virginia, in Roanoke, in Lynchburg, in Virginia Beach, um, also in two of our rural democracy centers, people are food insecure. So we run eating programs. In Lynchburg, they're actually building houses for uh, people that were formerly homeless. So that is what we do. If you do not have enough food to eat, if you do not have shelter, government obviously is not working for you. But all of these different things give us an opportunity to build trust within a community and then work with communities on ideas that can bring a solution. Perfect. Yeah. Um Mike, you could you could uh, just uh, highlight Andrea Loday and Michelle if you can do that. That would be fine. Um, um, other questions in the in the chat. Um, I'm looking here. Um, the uh, the 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 divine nine. Um, that's a term that a lot of folks are not familiar with. And HBCUs. I'm not sure everybody knows what that acronym means. But just if you could just 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 uh, help us understand really the significance, the importance of the divine nine and the HBCU community, and and also the fact that the our Democratic presidential candidate went to one of these institutions here, Howard in Washington. Um, so any thoughts on that connecting with the black academic centered community? Um, the D9, uh, the divine nine sometimes refer to themselves as the D9. These are the black Greek societies, the black fraternities and the black sororities, because I come out of academia um, I have experience working with these groups, especially when it comes to civic engagement. HBCUs are historically Black uh, colleges and universities. So you find a number of them in the South. You also find them outside the South. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, Michelle Loday, do you want to add anything to those, uh, the, to either of those? I mean, Loday, you've got experience with the democracy centers, right? Down your, down in Alabama. Georgia. Yes, Georgia. In Georgia, yeah, Georgia yeah. Um, relocating to Alabama, but in Georgia is where. You are. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, where in Alabama? Uh, Evergreen, Andalusia, Owasa, that area. Okay. Okay. It's like okay. an hour in between Mobile and Montgomery. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think you're in that new CD too. Yes. Yes. So, we got to get you running for Congress again, Lode. We want to get, get, get you man, started no, early. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm working now. I'm working. I'm pulling my magic. <laughs> okay. You're also, awesome. Also, as a member, I'm a, D, a D9 member as well. So I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, right? And as Andrea said, our organizations are great with civic engagement. And that is one of the principles that many of us share in commonality as far as our founding is concerned. So yes, when you need boots to the ground, when you need people to, to pass out palm cards, when you need doors to be knocked, when you need phone calls to be made, that is who you want. Also, there's the other side, you know, behind the, the behind closed doors, uh, having the meetings, having the discussions as far as what to draft, uh, hearing the concerns. A lot of times, 
I'm a HBCU grad as well. And a lot of times when we hear, you know, the collegiate experience, the experience that you have at an HBCU is completely different than a PWI. That's and true. many mm -hmm. of the concerns that we'll have in our community, especially if we uh, our families coming off of the poverty line, you, you, you get what I'm saying? Um, those issues bleed over into your undergrad career as well. So you still have those concerns. Myself, I'm the first person in my family to graduate college on my mother's side, not my, I mean, excuse me, my father's side, not my mother's side. So that is a, a, a blessing and a curse in and of itself because there are unique nuances that the average college student will not have to go to. And that speaks to mental well-being. That also speaks to financial security, food security as well. And if you're going to one of the smaller HBCUs like I did, you may be talking about housing stability. You get, so these are all still issues that the average HBCU college student is addressing. College doesn't necessarily mean that you have uh, averted the obstacles of the impoverished of your community. A lot of times at HBCUs, you still experience that. These are things that you are carrying along with you. Excellent, Lode. Yeah, Portable, thank, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Michelle, do you want to add any to those topics right now? Uh, you're muted if you're speaking. Um, but we'll take uh, Barbara uh, Pearson has a question, and I have a, a, a follow-up uh, as well. Barbara. Well, I just wanted to start saying that I was really thrilled to be able to participate with um, GOTV through um, the phone banks for Center for Common Ground. Um, and I recommended them to everybody because they were so much more congenial. I mean, we were, I think we were only calling Black people, right? So they yes. were being very, very friendly, you know, they were not adversarial and so forth. It was, um, but I was just wondering if you had a sense, and I, I know this is about trying to reach out to the communities. Um, were there in fact, okay, if you had been working on issues in the communities, right? Like for each of the communities where your grassroots people are, they find out what the what matters to the people there, and then try and work a camp, not a campaign, but at least do something to get to get people mobilized to to work on that issue. Um, was that was that as successful this year as you usually are, or were you having more trouble with defining a, a sort of a smaller a small set of issues that could be worked on that could bring more people in? Am I am I clear? Was it harder this year than in other times to to come up with unifying topic, you know, issues within the communities where you were working? Oh, um, um, oh, oh, you go first. Oh, oh, Michelle, you haven't spoken. I, I, I want to hear what you have to say. You're in a state that I know nothing about, so Pennsylvania. In central Pennsylvania and stuff. Oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I would say it was a little harder, but less more because everyone was obsessed with this election and a lot of where people's energy was going was into the election. But, but at the same time, I am happy to say that for those of us who were, who are more activisty, we were still doing our regular stuff. So I have friends who are on the youth aid panel working with young people, trying to keep them from being incarcerated. I have people who are working with Bridge of Hope and other programs, working with homelessness. And we were still doing all our stuff, but all the excess time was really devoted to the election. So I feel like the election sucked a lot of energy out of some of the other forward, other kind of forward activism. Um, I didn't think it was more difficult. I think that we do have certain unifying things, but um, I think this was a very divisive election, like even set up to, especially in the swing states. Um, like I didn't, even, I wasn't even aware of half the messages that other people were getting until after the election was over. So, um, so yeah, so I would say yes, but I think that that will change 
and stuff now that the election is definitively over. Um, I also wanted to do a shout out for trade schools and um, community colleges, because here in the center of the state, these smaller schools are really where you would find people. And honestly, even in high schools, um, because we can, you know, work depending on the situation. There are young people doing activist stuff and they can be engaged. And sometimes that engagement is lost when they go away to a school where they're one of 50,000 people and they can't really connect. So sometimes the time to make the engagement is before they leave, not when they're in when they're in college. Anyway, I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Really, really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, so, uh, Andrea, do you want to swing back in with uh, your thoughts? Well, we are doing the sort of advocacy training education now that the election is over. I agree with Michelle, the election sucked. Not only for us, the air out of the room, it basically sucked all the money out of the room as well. We have our own voter files. We provide our entire tech um, IT backbone. And so buying all that, was phenomenally expensive. So after the election is when I always tell people, now we can go back to the pure education because we want people to know and understand. We also teach advocacy because now that there's a new Congress, now that there's a new General Assembly session. You're going to want to know what they're doing. You're going to want to hold them accountable. You are going to want to potentially go through and push legislation that will benefit your community. And we always want to stress with people in the community, we want you to look at what would make your community better for your family, you personally, your family personally, and your community. We need you to be selfish. Stop thinking about these personalities of who's running for prom king, prom queen. What do you need? That is what government is supposed to do. It is supposed to support what you need. And most people are not used to thinking about elections or government that way. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, really very, very thoughtful. Everyone here. This is really uh, an amazing gathering. And I'm just so struck with the with the calmness and the decorum and the uh, um the, the the professionalism, um, the delivery here, because I've been in so many circles, you know, since the election and people's or hair is on fire. And that's not easy. What you're doing today is not an easy task. That's for sure. I do have a question that is really stuck in me. Um, I uh, a couple of days after the election, I, I went over to my former house where I lived in Columbia Heights, which is an extremely diverse part of Washington, D.C., and encountered a a black homeless man who's very, he comes in and out of the house where he used to live. Um, and uh, James came into the house and and uh, he said, hey, Chuck, how are you doing? I said, well, after this election, not so well. He said, why is that? And I said, well, we just elected a fascist uh, as president. And he sort of turned on his heel and said, Harris is the fascist. She's the fascist. And so I I, 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 I I, then pivoted and said, well, you know, here's how I define fascism. And we've talked about this in these circles, right? State corporatism, the sort of economic connection between corporate and and uh, uh, and the political circle uh, and, and the state and and uh, religious nationalism and white supremacy or white nationalism. And he said, Kamala Harris is a white nationalist. She does the bidding for white people. She doesn't listen to black people. And he said, and the same thing holds true for Barack Obama. 
So I just wanted to see, are you hearing that kind of stuff? That's really kind of alarming in my mind. Um, but this, that, that, that whole narrative that Trump was pushing out that a lot of people here in this circle were ridiculing, which is she doesn't know her own race. She's running away from her blackness. She doesn't know this, that. You know. So race was an issue in this campaign, unfortunately, and it got wound up into the sort of personality racehorse thing that the media does. How do you address that? How do you? And 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 when when James said that, I said BS. I said it quite loudly, um, and I probably mishandled that conversation. But how how do we have that conversation? How do we bring people? of diverse communities right now, we're talking about people on the streets, working class people. Um, and, uh, and I also see a lot of triggers in buses where I ride. I'm usually the only white person riding the buses up, up and down Rhode Island Avenue here. Um, but it's really fascinating just to see the interaction between black and brown people um, where you'll find, I've seen this a few times where black men are triggered when they hear Spanish speaking women. And I've asked, I went back to James and others, and I said, why is there a trigger there? What's the response? And they said, they're speaking badly about me. I know they are, you know, in their in their Spanish language. And the language itself is triggering. So this is what fascism does, right, is it divides us. It divides us and it gets us finger pointing and angry at one another. Just want to hear your thoughts on, on how to handle this um, on, the, on the ground and what you advise your own organizers to do. I'd love to hear all your co comments from all of you. And then we're gonna probably put a, and then we'll take one, two more questions. Thank you. Andrea Lode, Michelle. I hear something very, very different. What we heard in our low income communities was it's still, and again, this is a failing of a political party that doesn't matter who we vote for, our lives are not going to be any different, so I'm not going to vote. So nobody was calling anybody any names. They were just, D, R, what the hell is the difference? There is none. Now, for some men, they were, again, we ran into the sexism. A woman can't lead this country. Uh, there wasn't that much of that. There was some. Um, and then we also had people say, well, I got a check when Trump was in office. So he will be better for the economy. Um, and now, interestingly enough, we are further south than you. I am in Virginia, and I am really talking about conversations that we had in Richmond, um, in the low-income housing projects, and conversations that we had in Virginia Beach and Norfolk over in our Oceanside Hampton Roads part. So I did find those conversations uh, very interesting. So we now have a slightly enhanced model where we are doing democracy hubs, where we are putting people directly in the housing projects. Uh, we are recruiting people from within the housing projects, not just in the city where the housing projects are, we are going directly into the projects. Yeah, I would Thanks. say for PA, and I just wanna just say something quick because I need to be off at one or soon after one. I think that there's a couple of things. I think that we're in populist times and I think the Democrats are seen in general as institutionalist and there's not the respect or belief in institutions that there were even like four years ago. So I think that that's part of it. I think that there are some black people and people of color in general who feel like the Democrats expect them to just vote for them, but don't really provide specific things for them. They just expect to get the vote, but they don't work for the vote. I think also that there are some sort of I, I really don't think that her hanging out with Cheney really helped her case because I feel for younger progressives in general and stuff, you know, but also for younger people of color. It was just basically saying we don't really need your vote. We're chasing never Trump votes. We don't need your votes. 
um, you know, especially when her father put us in a lot of the international situations that we're in now through his behavior. Um, I think also, let's be honest, Harris was a DA and I don't know her entire record, but in some circles that are more um, abolitionist, she's never going to get the thumbs up because she's part of the system and it's a system of over-incarceration of people of color and immigrants. And so she's not getting the thumbs up <laughs> and stuff. Even if she's black, it doesn't matter. She's still seen as benefiting from that system. So I think it's a lot of things and stuff. Um, I also think there's a class thing. I'm not gonna speak on behalf of the Latin community because I'm not part of that community, but I can say growing up in New York that things are far more complicated than sometimes as Demo the Democratic Party thinks it is. And I think that for people who have been here more generations, they don't necessarily see things, they don't sometimes don't necessarily see new people as a benefit uh, um, because they've been here for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So I think that things among people of color and particularly among Black people are far more complicated and stuff. And of course, there is the effect of really good, terrible messaging. I will say the other group messaged very effectively and in PA very often. And they responded to any criticism of them with something else. So I think it's a lot of things, but I, the number one thing that I feel in PA is just the feeling that we're just supposed to vote and get nothing for the vote. That's a lot of what I hear and stuff. We're supposed to vote and get nothing for the votes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Lode? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm going to go back to what I said uh, during my portion of the presentation, respect, hold space, and include. There is legitimacy in what James is saying. Again, that's a part of the Black American experience. As a Black woman that comes from at least 12 generations of Black women in this country, Ka Kamala Harris, she's not a fundamentally Black American woman. She's not. And that's okay to say. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's, what's not okay is to tell me and put it on me to say she's black and you accept it. When she is on record identifying as the first Indian or the first Asian woman, right? Now, again, it's okay to say these things. It's okay to say, well, I, I come from 12 generations. I know what a black woman is. Just because you have brown skin, that does not make you a part of that experience. Just like if I were to move to Asia and have children in Asia, that does not make me a part of that experience. You know what I'm saying? It's it, fundamentally. So that is the problem. One thing my party does, it will come from top down. It will tell you, this is what you need to accept. I have the right to say, I know better. I do not accept that. So that's one thing. The second thing, to be triggered by foreign languages, because it's not just Spanish, it's Mandarin. It's whichever foreign language that's come here that is shoehorned on top of the issues of fundamentally Black Americans. That's what it is. It's not necessarily having a problem with different cultures, different races, different heritage. The problem is, is that when immigrants migrate over here, their issues are shoehorned on top of us. Going back to that intersectionality, right? I'll say this. I know as someone that professionally translated documents for our military, that's what I did, 77 Lima, when I was in the army. I translated documents from Spanish to English, English to Spanish. I write Spanish. I comprehend Spanish fluently. I speak it intermediately because I never really... It. I didn't have many opportunities to speak, but writing and translating hearing, fluent, right? I know for a fact, yes, other people are talking about us, but that's a human trait. It's called code switching. As someone that speaks, a, a, I'll say, three languages fluently, 
uh, Gullah Geechee, as far as my native tongue, I do speak Gullah Geechee. As far as uh, my native tongue, I do speak Yoruba. I speak that to my children. It's called code switching. It's okay. We do that when we don't want people to actually know what we're saying because it can be deemed rude, right? That is okay to say as well. It is okay to know that, okay, the Hispanics, they're talking junk about me, right? Uh, when the Asian communities, if they speak Mandarin, when we go into the nail salons, yes, they talk big junk about us. Yes, they do. That is a problem that we have been combating on a grassroots level as well, because usually when new businesses come into the Black community, it goes to the Asian business owners, and then they treat us very poorly, right? So these are all concerns that, again, when we hear it, we have to respect it, because it is a part of our experience here being in America. But it is okay to say these things. That is what happened. It's code switching. Everyone does it, right? Lastly, the inclusion. This is what I would like to see my party do more of. Include us versus telling us what messaging that we should receive. When we are at the grassroots level saying, hey, we might not want to say it that way because it's not going to be received well. Again, the the going back to when I said um, organizations political parties have no problem with using the emotional intelligence, using the resilience of Black Americans, placating to us, if you will, putting on the, the show, if you will. That has to stop. If you want more inclusion from the Black community, you have to hear it from the ground up, not from the top down. And that's what we saw in this election. It was a lot of top down politics, a lot of top down messaging that did not resonate. It, it, the mark was missed. But I would say again, going back to respect, hold space, and include. Yes, you may not experience what James is saying. Yes, you don't see it that way. Yes, in many cases, it doesn't even make sense. But at the same time, it is a part of our experience because historically, these are the very same things, these actions, these uh, nuances, these microaggressions, they have been happening to us for centuries. We would know. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Sumo Day. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And no. uh, I put in the chat that um, when we talk about party, there is very little respect for the grassroots. There is absolutely no respect for the Black grassroots. The party in Mecklenburg, North Carolina, they raised $2 million. They allocated $50,000 to the Black community to do GOTV for 252,000 registered Black voters. So, um, and the money came out late, almost too late to do anything with. So it was like, all right, I guess we got to give y'all some. And that was kind of the attitude that they just threw it at us and were like, go away and leave us alone. Yeah. And then they wonder why they lost. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, really enlightening. Um, I hope everybody's getting as much out of this as I am. Um, we've got Mark. Mark was had a question. I think uh, he may have disappeared. Michelle's left. We're at. We are past the hour. I need to honor people's oh. time. Um, I do want to make sure that we have a shout out. Mike, do you have a link for the intergenerational summit that you can drop in the chat? I also just asked folks if you can help us with with uh, some support for our you know for one pair of states as well, and to underscore um, that the work that that Center for Common Ground is doing is so, so worth it. Really, you will be very very pleased. I have to say that for an organization that does as much. Uh, that, that 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 generates as much positive uh, grassroots activism, voter turnout, connection with people. I I I in for my for my uh, 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 from my perspective, there there are a few organizations that that uh, step up the way that Center for Common Ground does. So please support them. Uh, please support Andrea and her organization. Um, I'm part of that operation and part of that organization as well. Proudly to say so. Mark, Mark, your hand was up. Uh, I think before Mike and you stepped off. Did you have a a, a question? And yeah. and folks, if you can hang around, Mich uh, I want to honor your time, Andrea and Lode as well. Are you okay to stay? I'm good. I'm good. Lode, 
Are I you good? I, I Likewise, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good. Mark? I didn't step off, Chuck. Somehow it just dropped me. But thank Okay, you. that's cool. Go ahead, Mark, with your question. So, so first, like, like Barbara Pearson, uh, I've been working with uh, Andrea Miller's, uh, Andrea Miller and the uh, CCG for uh, actually the last three elections. And I, I called, I made, made 1,650 phone calls and, and spoke to over 1,000 people or left uh, voicemails and so forth. I really thought we were going to win Georgia. That's where I concentrate my efforts in general. Uh, and I was wrong. I thought we were going to win North Carolina, and I was wrong. But anyway, um, I, I wanted to. There's, I have too much to say, and you don't have time for me. But it did. It was scheduled till ten fifteen, according to what I got. But at any rate, um, uh, I just want to riff a little bit off of what Octavius was saying about space, about about respect, uh, particularly about respect, because although she used that metaphor of the crossing the street and so forth. Which is cute, but but really, what what she's talking about, and what I think we need to talk about in the single pair movement, and always have needed to talk about, is is um, what the experience she's talking about is a historical experience. It's a historical community experience going back to slavery and and post bellum South and the overthrow of Reconstruction and the effort to try and get out from under Jim Crow and lynching and everything else under the sun, and then we're moving to the north and all of the the tax from the unions and the redlining and everything else that people have been through is, is a huge wealth of experience. And, and the way I see what Andrew is doing and these other uh, wonderful women leaders is they are, although the discussion we're having is about the, the election and electoral politics, what they are doing is they're training within their community, within the black community, they're training leadership. That's what they're doing. And that's the leadership that we need to, to, to lead a national movement that's not just a single pair movement, but includes a single pair movement. And when we talk about intersectionality or we talk about um, respecting black people and so forth, we don't conceptualize that as respecting their capacity to be the main leaders. In the civil rights movement in the 60s, it arose out of the South. It arose out of the grassroots. And that's what Kane's movement developed from and all that. And, and we all know that history sort of, sort of, sort of. But then it sort of it, it petered out into something different, you know, and then there were internal fights and then there were white it sort of there was tremendous amount. But at first, the white support was basically to back up the black movement. It wasn't a separate movement, which was uh, somewhat different from what happened before the Civil War, um, where, where the North had a tremendous role in enforcing the situation. But so anyway, the, the thing is that. Um, we do not in this, the, the, the single pair movement, including one pair states, I mean, there are some working class people in it, but by and large, it's been, a, you know, a middle class movement. And it, it is not, has not seen the imperative of of uh, transforming itself into a movement that was led by people of color, uh, particularly the African-American community. Um, but it's through that kind of a transformation that you begin to break down some of those problems with you know, the different segments, uh, the way that's been played off against each other because of language and different things like that. And yeah. it's just really got to be done. Um, the yep. last thing I want to say, just take one second, is that um, I've drafted an essay, which I hopefully will get, eventually get published someplace, but I'll make it available to people in the draft form it is now. Uh, anybody that wants to can just write to me at my name at, at gmail.com. Uh, but it's called The Bribe. And it, it reflects... The election. Mark, Mark, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to just, to just we can we'll share that on our email. Um, I, I do, do I actually have to get moving myself. Right. Um, but if you can put your contact information in the chat, people can follow up with you. And I have a place where I think you can get it published. Op-ed news. All right. I can get I can help you get it published over there. Okay. Let's talk. Um, okay. Mike. Very good. Mike. Um, sorry, I, I just wanted to want to move this on a little bit. Mike. Thank uh, you, Chuck. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Mark. Stay in touch, Mike. I just want to thank Andrea and Lode and Michelle so much for being here. Um, I'll ask the question that I will get separate answers, not right now. My white daughter, nurse, came home last week and said, I hate all white men. Um, I'm working with black um, uh, health care givers, uh, and I can only imagine that their feeling is worse than my own white daughter's. So I will ask you individually, is there anything I can do? Um, talk talk with you later. 
Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, thanks for that, Mike. Um, yeah. Um, so, it, it, thank you again, uh, Andrea uh, Lode, uh and Michelle, who had to get back to work. You know, this is a, a working world, and for people to take their time out here, um, so many of us are, are 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 in or in retirement and have some some flexibility. But this is a work day for so many of us. Um, just want to want to wish everybody hold each other closely. This is a, this is a really difficult time that we're all going through. And I've, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling and trying to figure this whole question out of, of, of where is the best time and place where I can be of, of most benefit, especially to our more vulnerable communities. That's really the topic of our next intergenerational summit um, next Saturday, uh, November 23rd from 12 to two. Mike, if, if there's a link for that, if you have that, um, no, not yet. No, I'll have to send okay. it to, to the group. Okay, Later. but everybody, please keep an eye out for that and and please share um, because we're bringing in folks from the the trans community, the black community, immigrant community, Latino community, um, uh, disability community. Um, just off the phone with Egberto Willis, he's going to be able, he's going to join us. We all know Egberto. Um, really, really. Um, on the one hand, you know, with some trepidation but also excitement that we're going to be together. We're going to be in solidarity. We're going to be supporting each other and, and, and figuring out how to get through this together. So thanks everybody for being with us today. Again, uh, Lode, Andrea, Michelle, um, really, really grateful. I learned so much today and I'm going to listen to the recording uh, and, and make sure that I, that I get, that get, get the finer tuned points that you made today. So everybody have a wonderful weekend, hold each other, listen to each other in a way that I wasn't really doing well with James. So thank you for correcting me, Lode. You know, it's important. Call ourselves out, be self-aware, respect, uh, uh, hold space and include. Thank you for that. Really powerful. Andrea, as always, love to you and best to to uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the organization and all our friends. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend.